I was born with the right forms filled and the correct boxes ticked. Just on the fire, pretty white man who likes to colonize. Each meeting now sealed within a strange checkpoint. Each longing a trespass. Men, women, children have been moved like toys by my country. Because my eyes match the rolling hills of the countryside and my hair flows in the same texture as the tent. He likes war, makes promises to the poor, but they often die, that's fine, as long as he makes profit right. There are no documents to allow him to enter into his arms. Signatures of trade deals written with the blood of people now told to be grateful for the hands of God that came to shape them. In Britain right now, people are talking about Britishness. Who's British? Who's not? What makes a British citizen? And is citizenship for life? But what does Britishness mean? My dad came over from Hong Kong in the 60s on a British passport. He met my English mum in Stoke-on-Trent, where he opened a Chinese restaurant. Many of my films are made in collaboration with young people and explore ideas of identity. For this film, I was keen to find out how today's climate of division is affecting our sense of belonging, particularly for those of us who hail from other lands. So I linked up with some young writers in Sheffield to unpick the meaning of Britishness. What does Britishness mean to you? I'm like quite reluctant to, to call myself British, mm -hmm. even though I was born here, I was raised here, I spent all my life here. Because sometimes I think, because of the history of it all, like I'm reluctant to attach myself to that or, or want to belong to that. Mm -hmm. Then again, it's home to, to an extent as well. Yes. Yeah. Obviously, my family were born in Somalia as well. I consider myself Somali, sometimes hyphen British, mostly Somali. My initial associations with Britishness, I think it's quite a, st a word that um, has lost some of its humanity in terms of like the historical history of it. And I kind of link being British to kind of an imperial idea of like colonialism or whatever. But for me, this Sheffield, um, and being born here has like a different, as a warmer feel to it. So I definitely feel that I'm from Sheffield. My um, family live here, the people that I love, the community that I was raised amongst. So I affiliate myself more with being Sheffield or like based in the North. I don't really think of um, ideas of Britishness or nationality, I, I think, until it's presented to me in terms of like a tick box or like as a passport. But I definitely feel rooted and somewhat to this country. I don't think my identity or who I am revolves around where I come from. I feel like in school and in the system, we're taught that being British means that we're free, but we're not taught how to free ourselves. Am I British? Second generation, mum originated from Ireland, dad half Irish, half Asian, British. I find the word hard to distinguish, like does it mean English or does it mean living in Britain? I feel like Britain allows you to be British if it suits it. Work a nine to five, declining crime, find the time to light the skies. Be polite to other Brits, but be fine to hide if it doesn't mix. You have to fit the British criteria. If not, you're inferior and pushed out to exterior. Persona the, the opening line of my piece is, am I British? And I guess this, this question sort of set me up for the whole piece uh, as um, I was sort of answering the question throughout the piece without coming with a definitive answer. So it was, the, the whole piece was a sort of thought process as to what it means for me to be British and am I British and what does that actually entail, I guess. Take Churchill and the Queen as an inspiration. Churchill had his flaws and that's pretty blatant. I'm not trying to offend to any bigots hating, but do your research on your idols and they're all amazing. But I am British, I love Britain. But I love fair relationships like domestic abuse. It's like I question all its actions, yet I let it confuse. I look at all the kids that be dead on the news and I notice how the pattern is systemically cruel. Knife crimes are at an all time high at the moment, and the media seems to be pointing a finger at, at rap music because they don't understand rap music and because they don't understand this art form. And I think that's a big thing actually within in Britishness and within media. If it's not understood, it's therefore wrong. And if it's not understood, it's therefore to blame. And I think I talk about that in the piece quite a lot. It's like you're giving kids the tools to poison the youth. 
You teach kids from other backgrounds about Britain in school Britain needs to learn about other heritage too So education has failed them While politicians keep telling them lies And cutting jobs so their home is broken and it's not a surprise So they turn to the streets It acts like a family fine But this family sells bees, whites and medals with knives So a kid gets stabbed, retaliation then dies The cycle continues on and becomes a statistic of crime then Britain blames rap music and black music And that's the worst way, rap's expression of life So if crime is the only expression to write Maybe we should think about how it got like that in the first place Britain Much of our filming took place through the summer of 2018 This was the year that Carnival returned to Sheffield After a 24 year break we went down to see what we could learn about Britishness. Carnival has such a fabulous spirit that brings people together through creativity that Sheffield is just ready right now for that. For and I mean, look around today. Everybody, all kinds of people are here. Having travelled to different parts of the world, I always kind of look back at Britain, I'm like, I don't think she understands what she got. And it's not until really go to places where really are segregated, you realise how fortunate we all are here, if we make good of it. Today, everybody taking part, most of the people in that parade, they are today's British people. So this is very British. As when it comes to the Caribbean people, freedom from slavery is tied very closely to carnival and the celebration of carnival. It's an emancipation. Yes. That's it. That's all I could say. It's an emancipation. When you emancipate yourself from certain barriers and boundaries, it accumulates to this. It ex it's an explosion. That's all I can say. Carnival is an explosion of culture, class, races, creeds, everything all in one. Everybody. And it started in the cane fields of Trinidad and Tobago. That's how it all started in the cane fields. When the big man had their party, the slaves also had theirs. So Carnival was born in Trinidad and it just exploded all over the world. Being on the street is always important because of that sense of taking ownership of your town. This is the place where we live, where we work, and being able to be free in the street is a statement. With Britain playing a major role in slavery and having colonised many Caribbean islands, it seems Carnival can tell us quite a bit about Britishness. Carnival first appeared in Sheffield in 1979, thanks to Leroy Wenham, who came to England as a child in 1963, so is part of the Windrush generation. We asked him why Windrush had been making the headlines recently. Well, last year, um the government and the wisdom decided that um, they would deport a number of people from um, this country who they said um, had no rights to be here. They actually forget that sometimes in the rush to get people here, um, people came up on maybe their aunties' passports, you know, or their cousins' passports, and that was allowed at that time. So when they, when they ask you now as an older person to show your passport, and he says, well, I haven't got it. I came with my auntie, and my auntie died 10 years ago, so I have no proof, you know. And then it becomes a bit of a scandal, because that person has lived, worked, and contributed for 30, 40, 50 years in this country and has never had a problem. So it becomes a bit of an insult to actually expect people <laughs> to you know, go back. I know more about Britain than I probably do about my own island. You know, um, you know I have family who came here at the age of two and three who've never been back to the Caribbean and haven't got a clue about what to expect uh, within the Caribbean. The people have come here um, and have fought within um, the wars, you know, they've been part of the armed forces and so forth, you know. And it's as if those contributions have meant nothing, you know. Um, but I think, you know, that the politicians really need to look seriously at the contributions that we as black people have made to this society, you know. and continue to make. 
I've been British from birth, still I feel like a foreigner. So much oppression, so our souls need a coroner. How is it my people work so hard, but they're still sending my elders back a yard? How distorted, I'm seeing it reported, and can't believe my eyes and my people get deported. Asked to come help when the war hit, and this is what they're rewarded? Now nah, I forfeit, I quit. I'm not playing this game. God save the who? I ain't saying that name, Bonda. I'm royalty, taking my reign, I cross over. No one can tell me stay in that lane. I'm born and raised in Sheffield, but then obviously heritage, Bayesian and St. Lucian, Caribbean, Afro-Caribbean. Or oh, I grew up very British anyway, but I still know, I know my roots, but I felt like I pushed to know my roots. Cause I've always had a strong sense of like, I want to know something, like I want to know where I'm from. I don't see myself represented in the school I went to. I grew up quite a white area, um, quite a white school. And then, but when I went to London to go see family, it was all black. So then I'm getting this mix. So it's making me think, so why aren't I seeing people that look like these lot, like my family, when I go to school, we're not talking about none of them. Do you get me? Cause in, in other schools where there's more um, like diversity, they'll make an effort to introduce certain things and do stuff in Black History Month. I used to have to run the Black History Month things. I used to bring in, you know what the teacher said to me? I actually remember this, it's making me mad now. I said we should, do, we should be doing stuff for Black History Month. The teacher said, if you bring stuff in, you can run it. She thought I, she thought I wouldn't do it, so I did it. I did it and I brought stuff in and, I, and you know what happened? She took the folder and she said, okay, I'll look through it and then um, you can like, you can do a presentation. And she looked through it and I was like, oh, so what did you think, miss? And she was like, yeah, yeah. She started talking about Rosa Parks and um, Martin Luther King. And I did not write about Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King. I kept it strictly British. And I included some of my family history in there. She didn't even look at none of that. So I thought that was a bit dead. But then that next year, I got a teacher that um, was a bit more, was a bit better. And she actually did it with me. So in Britain, it's like I'm not British. And back her yard, them will call me the British man. So who really am I? So what is it fam? Can't anybody tell me who I really am? I'm an Afro-Caribbean and Britain's where I'm born in. Raised in Chef, South Yorkshire, I'm Northern. That's who I am, but remember, I am more than can be defined, but I guess British is fine. For me, Britishness at fruit as an individual is five generations in this country. Britishness means multiculturalism. Uh, or it should do. I don't think it does, but I think it should do. Britishness is just um, a variety of culture and like different opportunities for different people, so it's not just based around one opinion. At the time of filming, Majid Majid was the Lord Mayor of Sheffield. In his own words, Majid is a black Muslim refugee who became the youngest Lord Mayor in Sheffield's history. He invited us into his parlour to talk about Britishness. I think Britain's at that stage where it's trying to really find its identity. That's why there is a lot of discussions on what does it mean to be British. I'd feel more comfortable saying I'm more British than I am English. Oh. I just get the feeling being English is just white British. Yeah. Well, how would you, how would you describe that? I was thinking as you were saying that, I would consider myself English and British, and then also Caribbean, and then also African. Is, is that in any order? I'm black first. Just as like a, like, rather than being from a place, say in the Caribbean, I'm kind of black first. So when it comes to your identity, black? Black first, and then British. And then I put in the Caribbean African now, because I, I relate to Britain more than anything. And like for me, I'd say I'm a Muslim first, and then everything, like I said, comes secondly, because I think with religion, it kind of embodies British values. Religion does. I think it teaches you values. What are British values? It differs person to person. But I would say a British value is the acceptance of the other cultures and the multiculturalism that we have in the UK. Because, like I said, the British Empire, it was an empire, it wasn't a country. For example, where I'm from, Pakistan, back then it was India, and they call that the jewel of the British Empire. So how am I less British than, for example, a white British person? It's interesting because people like putting people in boxes. Mm. I think that's why it's to help other people understand. So that, like, it's easy to say, well, I'm British, I'm this, I'm that. Sometimes people struggle to understand, well, you can be numerous things, but also those identities can change. They're not written in stone. My first and foremost identity would be I'm a woman and I'm a feminist. I don't think you can be a feminist without believing in equality generally. Mm. And I think that's where it sort of gets a bit difficult to define. 
if I was to meet someone, I would first say that I'm Kurdish. But when filling out forms, I do identify as British. I almost feel like being British is, I want to say like a way of life, like just living here makes you British, no matter where you're from. Um, Cause like, I feel like I came here at the age of two, but I've still had almost every opportunity that every other British person has had or every other white English person has had. So I don't feel any different to anyone else. I think every time I feel like, oh, well, listen, I'm, I'm British. I feel that I should always sometimes get a knock back in the sense where literally I see certain far right groups or I'll just come across some sort of racism without me like structural racism or just basically just direct racism. And I'm just like, oh, maybe I'm not. Yeah. Do you think in a way with you like moving up to the position you're in now, you've sort of maybe been forced to identify with that whole Britishness aspect a bit more? Possibly because I do get questioned quite a lot and definitely since I've been doing this role, I've never had as much racism as I've had before. I... Have you seen them comments? Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, it's, it's... Yeah, it's definitely made me question a lot of things and reflect and just, yeah, just trying to literally think about my place in society and my identity, like would that be Muslim, Somali, British, lover of food, like, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> With World Cup fever rife, we were interested in finding out how football unites the people of Britain. Down Football Academy itself, we've got, we did a count of different ethnicities and we've got around 20 to 21 different ethnicities. So you've Bengalis, Pakistanis, Arabs, Somalis, you've got Roma, Slovak, Kurds, Iranians. So we've got a massive, uh, diverse community and they're all united in one thing and that's playing football. Whether they win or lose and the camaraderie that they've got with each other, I don't think you can I don't think you can find that anywhere else to be honest with. There's no negativity amongst players, you know. It doesn't matter what level they are, they accept each other, they just come for football. So football is absolutely the glue that binds. My parents are from Bangladesh, his parents are from Pakistan. For us we're we're not, we're not, except we don't feel really part of their culture because we feel that we pray and uh, sort of swear in English. So we feel our first language is English and always has been. So we don't feel really part of that culture. But when we're here, we wouldn't have it any other way. We, we just wouldn't. Yeah, I mean, it's a great country. Isn't it? I mean, how, what, how many countries do you get the diversity that we have? And then the friendships and the relationships and the understanding of culture, the food and everything. I think it's absolutely outstanding where Britain and British values have been. I think it's something to be proud of. Why don't you want me Why must we live in fear? Why must my blood stay ground? You talk of as if you fight the vows of the I think for me, music and, and poetry in general is very much about uh, identity and kind of finding myself in the music. My mum is, uh, she was born in the UK, she's half Ghanaian, uh, and my dad is British Irish. However, I also have the uh, heritage background from, from Germany and that we're in, in a lot of ways I identify as, as Jewish and how um, I, I still feel that I'm attached to that identity, the fact that my great granny kind of escaped Nazi Germany, that, that means something to me. It's interesting when, when people ask me you know, how I see myself. Because I think about how other people see me and I think some days when I walk into, I don't know, a cafe full of white people, I think they see me as a black person. Um, and then I think when I'm around my black friends, they see me as mixed or light-skinned, but perhaps not black. I think back to my great granny who uh, came on the kinder transport and I think Britain provided her a home and she was a refugee. What we need to do is remember that and remember how important it was to provide that space for, um, let's say, uh, Jewish refugees who were escaping the Holocaust. I think we need to remember how important that was um, when we have our preconceived ideas of what it means to be British. When patriotism's next to Satanism, you made this place your God now, guard it till you daily departed. 
Not here to stand impartial, my forefathers martyred, yet injustice harbours. Pressed with oppression and hardship, shipped from harbours to build western civilization. Taj Mahal's and plazas while you lounge in parlours. I could have been made in China, slaved in Libya, killed in Gaza. I don't know how people feel that they have uh, a right to claim Britishness for themselves, you know? Right. You have so many people who um, have a concrete idea of what it means to be British. Mm and then they apply that to everyone. And if they don't fit that certain mold, then they're not British. Right. Um, and and for me, that it's kind of nonsensical. And that, that whole kind of dirty side of patriotism where that comes from, where that stems from, is dangerous to me. And I feel like right. I, I identify as, as British in the sense that I'm, I'm happy uh, to be a part of British music culture and popular culture that comes from Britain. And I understand that this is the place that I live, but as far as taking on a whole place as my identity, I can't relate to that. I feel like we've been sold a bit of an elitist idea because um, having such a strong connection to a place is for landowners. For me, it's for, it's for colonizers and it's for people who uh, benefit off of having that uh, territory. They'd colonize the stars if they could. Kneel to pray against injustice as you should and face the slander of the ever deep wide web. Tell me what is moral good when subdued by the great grand history omnibus. In this face of apathy, it seems like moral fuggery, confused ideas. Time to chew our fear and then let's swallow up. A little wage slavery, go ahead and let me be. States built off the backs of refugees, we vilify and preach. Food plans to food stamps, to slave plantations, to concentration camps. Carrying this trauma in my DNA. I had a name, but you gave me a colour. Pioneers of capitalising off the back of Pangea. Well, I'm tick boxing number. Why don't you want me here? Why must we live in fear? Why must my blood stay What does Britishness mean to me? Eating Sunday dinner, mashed potatoes, gravy, sprouts. Britishness to me is caring for your neighbour, being friendly to everyone. It's nice to be part of the society in terms of being mixed, you know, obviously integrated and there's different backgrounds, different languages. Yeah. Could we talk about this a lot? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> cool. Yeah, it's weird. You kind of touched on not wanting to assign yourself to something that doesn't accept you. Right. Um, it's weird, like, I'm not born in Britain, I'm born in Jamaica, so I came here when I was really young, around eight years old. And it's weird, like, going through the naturalization process and mm. signing that piece of paper that then tells you that you're British. Mm. So I didn't think about it as much when I was young, but now when I actually think about it, it's like, well, what is being British for me? Because I've never quite felt home here. I think in so many ways, when you're made to feel like the other, like you don't exist in its system and mm -hmm. there's not that representation in a lot of its institutions, it's like, well, Am I British? Am I Jamaican? Am I, mm. well, what am I? Racism is always, I always feel like um, it's a feeling it's a feeling nowadays as if sometimes it's like overt actions but often it's a feeling that you get quite early on um, a few years ago my dad was um, attacked coming home so things like that that are tangible that you can't deny but sometimes there's a feeling um, or over judgment that you're from this background, so your experience will be like this, or you won't be allowed to do this. So it sometimes it's a l not so much black and white. It's a bit more um, ambiguous. But I definitely think there is a rise of um, of racism in Britain, and I think it does go somewhat unchallenged because it's not always expressed verbally. It could be through an action. It could be through denying someone a right. Um, and I think we don't really particularly address that because race is not, I don't think, really discussed in Britain, not the way that it is openly in America. It's hard to engage with an idea or a concept that doesn't want you. Um, so being British and being a black woman is very, very difficult and has become more difficult, very surprisingly enough, has become more difficult over time considering the challenges that we're facing right now. When you are a, a black Muslim woman, it is gonna be about race because that's part about your experience of the world and that's how you're perceived. So I think we should do less to discredit people of color and listen more um, and learn from their experience. I think sometimes racism is simply ignorance and that can change, but if you're not willing to engage with that, then you're just only going to perpetuate that racism more.
massive Eid Mubarak and to everybody who's here to celebrate. This year, Ramadan fell at the height of summer. After some long, hot days of fasting, Eid finally arrived in Sheffield. We went down to Eid Fest to learn a bit more about this worldwide celebration. But how do you know exactly when Eid begins? People do ring, let's say, Pakistan and say, oh, have you seen the moon yet? Oh, yeah, we have. Okay, yes, that's it. It's Eid tomorrow. In the Muslim calendar, there are two Eids. There is one Eid that comes after Ramadan, which is a month of fasting, and that's a... Um, a celebration to remember those that are less fortunate and to put yourself in their position. And I think the biggest thing about it is families coming together, spending time with each other and just having a good time. I think it's so nice when like these events happen because it brings everyone together. It doesn't matter what colour you are, you just enjoy it for the sake of just getting together. Ramadan isn't just about not eating food, it's about focusing on your faith and I think that's the beauty of Islam that you have this one month that just rekindles your relationship with God and refocuses your energy as to what you're doing with your life. Well, my mum is half white, half Yemeni, and my dad is Pakistani, so I am half Pakistani, quarter Yemeni and quarter white. I like it because when I speak to people, I can like tell them all the different backgrounds. Like, I can relate to a lot of people, if you know what I mean. I think being mixed is quite nice. Growing up, I didn't know if I was Yemeni or English, I couldn't relate to the Yemenis because I didn't wear a headscarf. Like, I, I'm not a Muslim, I'm, I'm like, I believe in, like, I'm a free spirit. I think some people are quite narrow-minded and they don't like to think about other people's backgrounds, they don't like to accept other people's beliefs. And I think, yeah, they just like to don't like to accept anyone else. I went to King Edward. It was very, um, very multicultural, and that's what I loved about King Edward. Everybody was open, everybody was accepting, all the teachers were like, they were happy to help everybody, and that's what I loved about King Edward. I wish I had that kind of like supportive atmosphere while I was growing up, because I think in my school it wasn't like that. So I thought they always kind of neglected the Pakistanis, and in our year it was always the white people with the white people and the Pakistanis with the Pakistanis, and I didn't like that, because I wanted it to be like a big like community and feel like, you know, like welcoming. I was born with the right forms filled and the correct boxes ticked because my eyes match the rolling hills of the countryside and my hair flows in the same texture as the Thames. My complexion serves as conservation to your comfort in British. My passport doesn't read empire. It doesn't stop me for random selection before my flight. It doesn't pat me down or grope with just cause. It doesn't empty my luggage, pour my life to the floor. It arrives on wood. I think my poem came from a place of not really understanding what Britishness meant to me. I've never really considered this sort of nationality that I have, and I think it was a very interesting project to be a part of and to hear other people's thoughts because everyone's was completely different. So I guess the poem is me exploring that in terms of the history and culture we have and the unsaid atrocities, which I think is probably why I don't associate with the nationality I have. It arrives on wooden ships with shackles open to claim what isn't ours and rewrite others' history. To label them savage, a brute without correct words, our white saviours renaming the named, those we refuse to hear. There's a sense of shame that's never talked about and I think it's very important to highlight and emphasise that being a white individual who has that privilege to be able to go and not acknowledge those things, I think it's very important to do that because fundamentally that's what got Britain to become an economic power and then as a result make America an economic power. My passport should read values past the whitewash of textbooks on the bookshelf, scribble red ink improvements in the margins and highlight our mistakes. Our past and present, this definition of who and what is British, an identity we simply can't ignore. I think Britain itself and British people are quite accepting of pretty much almost everything that's, you know, like uh, sexuality, 
uh, religion, no one will look at you weird if you say you're an atheist or you're... I don't think that's you. You know, know what? Yeah, I, 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 yeah. I was going to say, I think it's very area dependent. I think people like to... It's like the tolerance yeah. thing is keep it over there and I'm all right with it. Yeah. As soon as you bring it next door to me, now we've got a problem. Yeah. And let's be honest, like religion, like it's every other, if you look at the tabloids or whatever it is, it's, there is massive Islamophobia and anti-Semitism, not just in politics, in society in general. So I would definitely not say there is a tolerance in religion whatsoever. There's been discussions of, you know, discussion like, let's, let's ban the burqa, let's, women can't wear this. But it's like, listen, it's what happened to this tolerance? I think you've kind of got to keep it simple and look at, who is in the position of power and look at their backgrounds and they're all and it's the truth they're all just elderly middle class white males eaten and yeah nice. there you go and <laughs> <laughs> and and how do you expect things to change um when when people in power are like that because they're the ones making the decisions and kind of dictating how our lives are <clears> going to be lived for us i mean like it's all good and well putting such and such in children's curriculums but what they don't understand is you've got to start from the top down, not the bottom up. It's not going to work that way. So I completely understand what you mean. We need, whether that be more women and more people from the LGBT plus community, more people from a, a BME background, just to represent. I think that's one great way we'll be able to generally have equality in the country. Making this film about <laughs> Britishness and what it means to be British. Right. So what are your thoughts on that topic? Well, obviously I'm British on the way I was brought up in England society at school and stuff, but then my Jamaican came out at home and among, and among my peers. Black man, so a lot of people don't really see me as a British man. They just see me as a black man. So they say, oh, where are you from? Where are you from? I said, England. I said, no, but where are you oh, really he's from? from? from. He's from, from so, he? yeah. yeah. I know that I'm not really from here. What about when you go back home, though? Do you think they embrace you differently? Yeah, they call me Englishman. Yeah, exactly. I, was, <laughs> I said this the other day. I said the other day when we're here, we're not English when we're back yard, isn't it? Yeah. You are English. Yeah. So, yeah. the way I just define myself is I'm a black British man. Mm. That's it. Can't say no more. Black and British. What do you mean? Being black and British? Being black and British. Yeah, you can play a football team, can't you? <laughs> you can do that, huh? You're talking about black Britishness. You, you're pushing it more to racism now. Right, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're asking about Britishness. But you're pushing the subject more towards racism. Right. So what is, is, what what is Britishness? Huh? I don't understand what people say. Do I feel mm. British? I don't understand I'll it. Give an example. I don't understand the I'll question. Give an example. I'm 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 African, right? Yeah. Uh, my girlfriend, she's English. Yes. My boys, yeah, they're half African, half, half British. Now, for me to call myself British, right. like government-wise, I have to do a test. Mm. I have right. to go in and do a test with all these questions that. I wouldn't even I've, know the answer to know. British. Yeah. That yeah. someone who is British yeah. wouldn't know, yeah. but I'm expected to know. Right. And I'm, in government's so, eyes, so that makes me, yeah. that's, the, that's Britishness. If, if you're white, I guess we probably need a white person here to ask, like, babe, how, what would you class yourself? She, she I come, come from a small town with small predominantly town. white people. We know we would never move there because I've got mixed race kids right. and I don't want to bring them up there because of the, the views that people have there and the culture that's embedded within that smaller society. Oh, I think you can look at the culture, mm. people's background. Yeah, you throw in racism there because that, that's part of it, isn't it? Yes. Britishness. Because someone, most, if you look, I think people who class themselves as being British, then it's usually white people. Yes. Yeah. As a, as a black person, you, you might, you guys might have been born here, you're you called English or British, oh, but you'll never be accepted. Uh, no. It's not going to happen. No. Is it? I was yeah. born here, but yeah. guess what? I would, I would never wear an England shirt. Why not? Why not? Because I don't feel that included. So why I don't, not? I don't, I've, I've let my son wear it. You know, my kids wear it, but. I would never Cup, yeah. wear it. You won't support England. I'm right? not support. I support England. Don't get me wrong, but I'm not wearing no shirt. I wear a Jamaican shirt. Right. I wear, I wear an African shirt. shirt. Nigerian shirt. But I'm not wearing no British shirt. Not no England. 
Even though there's North England, British, you know, so are you, British are you aiming to change the views of your children? Yes. Or are, are you, do you, Answer, you are British. Do your, do your children view everything the way you're used to? No. You know what's different? I want to tell you something. There's a difference between the way how we was brought up yeah. and our children are being brought up. Mm. So my, my first generation uh, British. So my mum came from Jamaica, my mum and dad from Jamaica. So we've got like Jamaican views still. You know, we got brought up like with, with the certain culture, whereas my kids now, they're being brought up British yeah. culture. You understand me? So that Jamaican, it rubs off a little bit, but not not too much. It's diluted for the generations. To speak your mind. This is where you get yeah. to speak your mind. Where PC culture don't exist. No, that's right. <laughs> Because everywhere else you get judgment now, barbershop, no judgment. That's right. You speak your mind. After something big happens, everybody can have their own opinion yeah. and everybody can walk about and be off saying their piece. Yeah, man, you can include Place where uh, I say it's somewhere where black, black male energy lives and doesn't die. Mm -hmm. The only place where it doesn't die. A well shaven man meets expectation. I learned this in a barbershop. I like to spend time here. These men walk a certain integrity I could only reserve for trying to convince my legs to move. They sow seeds of new beginnings, so sovereign. And they talk the folklore like a sort of absolute. There's an untold beauty in the poetry of these people. The community philosopher shaves seconds from days, perfecting his hypothesis, one of solemn, one of practice. There's a beauty. Shed the old. A man with a clean-shaven beard has a healthy mind and a barber is a therapist. <laughs> Mostly I believe that the education system hides behind like the European history more. Yeah. And we kind of Absolutely. Look, and we look at a lot of European atrocities as opposed to British ones. In secondary school there's a very um, there's like a repeated sense of history of certain things. You do indigenous people, when you do sort of Native Americans, we look at the American atrocities and then we look at the German atrocities, but we never look at British atrocities. And I think when you look back at it, it just results in going through the history of it and becoming embarrassed and ashamed of where Britain comes from. I meant to catch the falling bodies. Men, women, children have been moved like toys by my country. Signatures of trade deals written with the blood of people now told to be grateful for the hands of God that came to shape them. I cannot walk this road and not think of those who have walked it before me. That was about um, when I travelled to Hong Kong and I remember um, just walking the streets and I saw a massive HMV sign and next to an M&S shop and I thought, why are these places like from Britain in Hong Kong? Because I don't really know much about empire or history. The crack of the whip has been silenced by the changing of names. Gucci Shan to Victoria Peak, the handing over of their lives for ours. The smell of opium war in the dockyards, the jewel on a South China Sea. I, I kind of came home, I looked, I looked up like the empire of Britain. I saw this slogan of what the British Empire was and it was like the land where the sun never set because it was just so vast and covered like half of the world, the sun never actually sat on it. it I felt like, why have we not been taught about this? Back in Darnall, we discovered it's not always a level playing field when it comes to progressing from academy level football. Unfortunately, uh, Asians, they don't get the representation that they deserve and, um, th yeah, they don't get the same opportunities as everybody else and it does make them feel very, very negative. Uh, you lose morale, uh, even as a football coach. One of our young kids, he scored, I think, 90-odd 90, 90 goals this season, uh, one of the under-8s. And um, his cousin came up to me yesterday, only yesterday, and he was like, yeah, uh, why, are you st why are you guys still doing this? It's not as if he's going to break through into football anyway. So the lack of belief is really there. We know that racism in football is, is structural racism from top to the bottom. And, <laughs> you know, we, we're, we're not even given a chance before we've uh, laced his boots. You know what I mean? Before we've even stepped onto that pitch, 
we've got everything against us. Part of my job is traveling the world. I go to different countries and uh, whenever they ask me, what's your nationality? I will always say British because yeah, my parents are Pakistani. Uh, they came from Pakistan, but I was born here. I was brought up here. This is my country. And it does, it is very, very important to me actually. Um, they think that Asians are just about cricket. You know, I mean, we've had Amir Khan break through in boxing and I mean, that was a massive thing. But really football is, in this area, especially in, in, in the area, you know, in Sheffield, football is the main sport that everybody enjoys. And there is a common misconception. People think that we just, you know, like these other sports. No, we, we are about football. We won't go to the pub to watch the game. It's just literally because we're Muslims, we don't drink. And for that reason, we won't, you know, we'll, some of us might go to a pub, but some of us choose not to go to a pub. Doesn't mean we're not watching the football. It doesn't mean we're not enjoying the football. You know what I mean? It's still, it's still uh, a sport that's in our hearts. Yeah! Yeah. There's a lot of room for disruptiveness to change the kind of narrative of what is Britishness and get back to understanding what real multiculturalism is. You know, it doesn't matter what language we speak or what colour we are, we're all one. And when we can get over that, that's when this country will be more peaceful. I'm obviously a black woman, but I wouldn't say I was a black British woman. But I do tick British on the form. And I like Shakespeare. <laughs> and in terms of Brexit, what are your thoughts on that? Even in the school when it was all happening, the amount of kids that then thought it was okay to be racist, to be Islamophobic, those two in particular, it was disgusting. And the fact that it was so just acceptable in society at the time, nothing got done about it. You're right, it did embolden a lot of the far-right racists and bigots to be like, listen, we won. we've got our country back, whatever that means. I mean, the thing is, it's easier to tackle because the problem is you spend, when it's covert, you spend half your time explaining how it's real to people that will never see it. So what do you think the answer is? What do you think people, what do you think you guys can do? I, I study politics, right, at, at Six Farm. What influenced me to do that wasn't any politician. You know, I, I've never looked up to a politician in my life, but I, I look up to musicians and, and artists. In terms of making a change, it's the young people, talking to the young people. If you're going to do something, try and make a difference at the same time. After the World Cup, Finn met up with England defender Kyle Walker to talk to him about identity, belonging and growing up in Sheffield. As a musician, I found music brings people together. I'm assuming as a, as a football, it's a similar experience. Football bringing different people from different backgrounds together. I feel if you just look in the England squad now that we're in, um, there's a lot of people from all, all types of different backgrounds. And I think, you know, no one Whenever we're in camp, no one's treated better than the other or no one's got a high ranking just because you're from, you know, your dad might be Jamaican as for mine, for example, you know, Raheem Sterling, he was born in Jamaica. Uh, but, you know, we all come together as one, we're a team and we're, we're representing England. So for me, it's kind of, you know, the colour or wherever you're from or whatever like that, that just goes into the background and you're just normal human beings. So, like you, I grew up in Sheffield with parents from mixed backgrounds. So, can you tell me about your cultural background and what it was like growing up mixed raised in Sheffield? I think the estate where I grew up in, um, there was probably more, you know, more black people than, than, than English people and white people. So, I kind of just fitted into it. Um, now, I know my dad said he had a hard time growing up around Sheffield and everything, but no, for me, it was, it was just a normal. You know, there was a lot of Somalian people, a lot of Pakistani people, and we all just mingled together. But, you know, how we talked and how we got on was playing playing football. So when do you feel most British and least British? For example, uh, so I know you've been to Jamaica a few times. Yeah. You know, did you feel like a connection there, for example? No, obviously, um, you know, my dad being a, a proud Jamaican man, um, at home we always used to eat Jamaican food. Mm. Uh, he taught my mum how to cook it. So my mum cooks it now and everything, probably cooks it better than him, to be fair. So for me, I've always had that connection and I feel it was very important when I did go to Jamaica for the first time, you know, to go and see where my dad's from, go to his mum and dad's house and see the way how he was, you know, how he lived and, you know, how he got brought up. It's a, it's a big eye opener, I can assure you that, but, you know, I feel it was good for me and it taught me a lot, you know, a lot of values in life. So in the past 10 years, in terms of racism, uh, on and off the pitch, has it changed in the last 10 years? It's always going to change, but it's always going to be there as well. You know, there's going to be the selective few that, you know, don't take people's feelings or backgrounds into consideration and want to just say what they feel. Um, now that's up to them. 
you know, they've they've got an opinion. If it's right or wrong, you know, it's, it's obviously it's definitely wrong. But you know, if they feel that they want to say that, then I just kind of think, you know, be a better person, let them say it, let it go in one ear and out the other, and you know, keep just keep doing what you're doing. In 2005, Sheffield became the first city of sanctuary. As one of several safe spaces in the city, Umix hosts the Refugee Social Club. One of its volunteers has been seeking asylum for the past 10 years. We asked him how this has affected his sense of identity. Am I Zimbabwean or am I British? Um, uh, my only countrymen believe that I've changed, but the British still believe that I'm Zimbabwean. So uh, where am I? So it's, 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 a, it's like uh, somebody who's uh, stuck in the middle. Um, was neither a, a bird or, or an animal. This is uh, the categorization that they give to birds, isn't it? Is it an animal or is it a bird? <laughs> I cannot work. The only thing I can do is uh, volunteering. And then the fact that uh, I cannot go back to my country of birth uh, because of political problems there, um, I feel I'm stuck in kind of a limbo. Recently, during a routine visit to the immigration centre, Victor was detained and threatened with deportation within four days. After over 79,000 people signed a petition for his release, his case came to the attention of his local MP. Uh, she intervened on my behalf whilst I was in, uh, in detention and um, spoke uh, uh, in my favour in Parliament and also spoke uh, to one of the immigration officers. And Possibly, that's uh, what enabled me to, to be released. And I was then given a, a three-month reprieve. And uh, then I was released from detention, and here I am now. I came here personally to look for protection. So why would uh, a democratic country like Britain send somebody back to a country where they knew that uh, they were going to be subjected to inhuman treatment. It is uh, quite ironical that um, uh, the British can go out, but they don't want other races to come to the, to the British Isle. Yet, um, I would like to believe that uh, Britain can be a model of um, um, integration if the politicians have got the will to do that and not pandering to, to, to right-wingers. It will be a model that can be spread all over the world. Her border had once been the length of him. Her horizon, the width of his thinning arms, each meeting now sealed within a strange checkpoint, each longing a trespass. But her homeland remained his face. The Dabagala squirrel, his jaw about a couple that I knew. So they had this sort of like really beautiful, um, over 30 years um, marriage, but um, she was never granted a, a visa to come and see him. So they kind of had this scattered um, love affair around the globe and they'd spend pocketfuls of years in Ethiopia and Somalia. And, and then it wasn't until he passed away that she was granted her um, the visa whatsoever. And it just seemed so sad. I don't know, so when, when he actually passed away, she was just in France, even though the majority of their relationship was like across the oceans. So I wrote that poem about sort of a love that transcends borders and how even when she was furthest away towards the end when he was hospitalised, she still felt closest to him when she would call him and we'd go around over the phone to him. Like a verse has to do with like healing and peace. And that's what I like about poetry is that it's a bit of a poetic justice in writing an ending that they deserved. In this final hour, there are no documents that allow her to enter into his arms, to gently ruffle the hospital covers to wake him for fudging, to wash his body, to read his Janazah prayer. After 10 months of having conversations around Britishness, we all got together to watch a rough edit of the film. We were intrigued to see if by compressing so many different voices into 50 minutes, the documentary would give us a fresh perspective. I think everyone has a completely different idea of what Britishness is. Um, I mean, some people may be born and bred in still don't feel British at all. Um, and some people may have come here at a later age and feel 
more British than they've ever been. It's not until this project that I had to really think about what British is and I think I kind of mentioned to you, it's a bit like that film brought it to my awareness that it's like this big Saturday suit that Jamaicans will have on a Saturday. Yeah. You know, it's filled with potato, your mm-hmm. pumpkin and all sorts of different ingredients, but it yeah. makes up the flavour, it makes up the richness of that soup. I and that is it, exactly yeah, what that. Britain is. Seeing what other people are saying about how they feel British, how they feel in this country, is sort of working into my own identity. It's as if Britishness is a collective thing, how other people feel rather than just a personal thing. So when I was watching it, I was thinking it'd be so cool if all those people could actually get together. Because it kind of feels like they're together in the documentary, but if they could actually get in a room and have that discussion and then work with each other, it'd be like something amazing. It creates a sense of hope that we are progressing somewhere might be a bit slow, might not be getting there as quickly as we'd like, but it's moving. There's a certain amb- ambiguity to it that you just can't put your finger on what it is. Mm. But I think that is an answer in itself. The, the answer is that there isn't an answer so, to Britishness. Watching Victor's clip, just knowing that 79,000 people signed for him to get out of being deported and all those things, that all happened while we were filming. And I just think, 79,000 people. Just people coming together, you can just see what it does. We have to get to a point now, I think as, as a nation, where we don't disregard the history, where we own that. Yeah. Um, and that happens structurally, it happens higher. And I think when that begins to happen in the system and the people that actually runs the system, maybe minds will start to change. Maybe the people, the second generation, the first generation Caribbeans or Africans or whoever it is that came here, their their whole their hope will start to change. Yeah. But until that is owned, until that history is properly owned on a systemic level, there is there is going to be a lot of tension, there is going to be mm. a lot of animosity. I remember being in secondary school, my best friends were Pakistani and you know I was bullied a lot in secondary school for being gay and my friends, uh, my Muslim friends, my Pakistani friends, they always stood up for me and you know I hear people being racist, I get these people out of our country, um, but they are our country. When it comes to like the BNP and, and just oh, parties right, yeah. like the yeah. air. Yeah, yeah. Um, how British to them is just completely yeah, a, a, yes, a white Britain. A white Britain, yeah. and that is not what it is at all. And I think I think it's fair to say, even though we said it, it it's it's subjective to an individual. Yeah. I think it is fair to say that it's just not that. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. it, even though it's sort of going back on yourself and it's sort of contradicting my, my, my original point, I think it is fair to say it's not that because it's been proven through the different flourishing communities in Britain that it's just fair to say that that's not the case, do you know what I mean? That it's a lot more than that and yeah, there's leniency to discuss what it is within that but what it isn't is 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 one race within Britain because it's just, we're past that, do you know, we're, 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 you know what I mean? If anything, we're past that and that's a nice feeling, I guess. So many of the narratives around Britishness today are led by the media, both mainstream and social media. But the real-time, face-to-face conversations we had felt different. We heard voices and opinions that are rarely heard. I was inspired by the optimism of young people and their commitment to personal and systemic change. What draws us together, it seems, is the human need to belong. I feel like there's such a difference between the modern Britain today and there's a different Britain that is again fighting for something that's not theirs, that's fighting for dominance, that's scared of becoming a paper tiger. Um, And I think the modern Britain, we're just fighting for freedom for everyone. Whenever they ask me what's your nationality, I will always say British. I was born here, I was brought up here, this is my country and it does, it is very, very important to me actually. Britain is such a rainbow country and they have to learn to accept that. There's no going back now. We can only move forward. Britishness becomes a way, it becomes a way of life, but it doesn't mean that you actually have to forget where you come from. Let's raise a glass, a toast, to mechanical marvels, the NHS and Mum Sunday roast to the trailblazers that refused to beg, steal and borrow, Majid, Desiree and the poets of tomorrow. They were fed here, nurtured 
and led here. This land nourished their minds, bodies, and souls, and we gave them to the world. What did we get back? Their culture, their history, and their lives, we conquered and colonized. Heroically, we took a stand, fought and bled for their land, our land. Wounds heal, but scars remain, lost and alone. Feeling the weight of a bloodied history when I hear, go back home. Britain stands up tall, empires rise and fall, but through it all, we raise a glass. Here's to the Windrush generation, our thanks. Here's to love without borders and tanks. Here's to knowing the truth of our past. Here's to growing together at long last. Here's to a Britain that's for you and me. Here's to the future, whatever colour it may be. Keep that glass held high as we beam with pride and cheer. Britishness, what if it's more than just being born here? Thank you.